Okay. Uh, the recording will be made available uh, on the meeting page. But before I start, I want to welcome um, Hart Montgomery, who's the newly installed, maybe not that new, but newly installed CTO of Hyperledger. Uh, Hart and I go back, uh, way back since the beginning of uh, Hyperledger. So I would like Hart to say a couple of words before he drops off, if he, if he wants to, that is. Sure, <laughs> I'm happy to say hello. Yeah, it's great to see you, Vipin. Um, it, uh, yeah, we have been uh, working in Hyperledger since the very beginning. Um, and I'm excited to have the opportunity to uh, continue to move forward. Um, with you all. So um, I'm mostly here just to listen today. Um, as I said in the chat, I do have to drop early, unfortunately. Um, but I just want to hear all the exciting stuff that you all have to say. So thanks a lot. Oh, exciting for some, but <laughs> anyway, so the main uh, point that I want to make is if we want to participate in something like the Open CPDC project, then we have to uh, contribute something technical and Hart is the man to lead us there, um, especially in the cryptography arena. So I'll go, I'll go into a little bit of detail on open CBDC project when I start my presentation. And of course, people are welcome to interrupt me at any time um, and ask questions or contribute their thoughts to what's going on here uh, with CBDC. I'm not talking about world uh, world events in general, but just this particular topic. Um, and um, so I'm going to start a presentation, uh, share my screen, and start with that. But uh, You know, looks like uh, looks like I'm uh, I'm having problems with this. It's very strange. This uh, sharing thing has not been worked out properly. By yesterday, I was struggling with uh, uh, with. Uh, what do you call it? With the WebEx and they couldn't. Uh, PowerPoint as a virtual background. I think they have changed the uh, UI for this. Uh, So see that everybody can see this uh, screen here? Yeah, what we can see that. Uh, I'm going to start a slideshow. So hopefully you'll see the full screen without looking at all the details on my. Yeah, uh, seems screen. good. Anyway, so we are going to go through executive order of the president, uh, which is the uh, framing uh, conceit of this whole uh, CBDC thing. Then a short aside on geopolitics and CBDC, which seems to be missing from the conversation, but uh, is there in a big way in all, almost everything that everybody says about it. Then we go a deep dive, a slightly deep dive into open CBDC, which is the GitHub project, but it's also based on the Project Hamilton paper that was published by the Fed. And we have our own response to the Fed um, um, from led by Sandy uh, of the 22 questions that we are uh, going to respond to. That was the initial, uh, initial ask from the Fed, not directly related to the open CBDC or the project Hamilton because 
Project Hamilton is only a very small uh, part of the Fed's response. And as the executive order makes it clear, we'll see why. And of course, like I said, you, you are uh, welcome to interrupt me at any time. Um, so the executive order is the first acknowledgement of digital assets by the United States executive. Uh, does not directly address any del deliverables, although reading the uh, um, reading the commentary, one has the impression that they're going to start working on CBDC in six months, but that's not true. Uh, so the only deliverables they directly address are reports, more reports, of course, white papers, reports. Um, it's widely hailed by the crypto community because they didn't read it. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I have a feeling they didn't read it, but at least it acknowledges the existence of this huge class of assets. Um, and it's actually proposing ways to address it. So the contents, you know, there's policy objectives, you know, all the all the uh, things that you read read about here. But the fourth uh, bullet, CBDC, is what we'll be focusing on because everything else is sort of, um, you know, talking about uh, digital assets in general. Um, and the policy lays out the topic, saying it's because of the a swelling size and scope of uh, of digital assets uh, um, in the world. Well, uh, Biden cites uh, three trillion dollars in November, but I think it is slightly more diminished today because prices of all the digital assets that he um, talks about. I mean, when he, when he says digital assets, there he's um, only talking about non-state uh, digital assets, not state-backed. Uh, um, and he talks about data privacy security, which is kind of interesting because it's the first item on the list when he uh, puts, when the president's uh, office puts out this, uh, th this uh, uh, executive order, the first item is data privacy and security, which uh, should not surprise us because in uh, Europe, for example, that was uh, cited as the first, uh, you know, one of the most important items. Then of course, financial stability and system risk, uh, crime, which uh, is a popular topic in, in uh, cryptocurrencies, national security, uh, and the last one, I mean, you know, all this, uh, the exercise, human rights, financial inclusion and, and equity. And the last one, of course, energy demand and climate change is also another topic that is being discussed at length uh, in crypto Twitter and other uh, places where uh, the crypto, crypto addicts uh, converge. Uh, so this, you know, this might seem like a dense um, list of agencies, but the main thing to understand is that the coordinators are the assistant to the president for national security affairs. So national security is the first item. The second is the economic policy. So you uh, you uh, get a, a glimpse of the uh, priorities and the interagency process, which consists of all these different uh, different departments. First, it, it's a it's a enumeration of the cabinet itself, except for the Secretary of Transportation and EPA and other Department of Homeland Security is, uh, is there. And if you look at it, it's it's pretty much, I would say. 80% of the government agencies. I mean, it's 
its comprehensive list of everybody and anybody. Plus, of course, it closes with the Federal Reserve and CFPB, FTC, SEC, CFTC, FDIC, and OCC. So it's almost like, okay, this is the whole government is involved in this process. And I don't know who's going to write this report, but I think it is going to be the Secretary of the Treasury. Um, it's going to lead the effort and by within 100, 180 days, they're going to produce this report. Um, and of course, the report uh, lists all the items that we have seen before. But I just made bold the, um, the items that focus on what I think is geo geopolitical concerns, all right? Because this, at least three or four of, of those items can be said to be uh, address geopolitical concerns. So I tried to sketch out something, but let me stop you uh, because right now, you know, this is pretty much, I just created this from, uh, from my brain, you know, I, I sort of looking at all this stuff. But if anybody has uh, any comments so far, before we dive into the open CBDC uh, project, because I'll discuss the technical details a little bit before uh, for this. But if anybody has any comments, it would be great to hear. Uh, not seeing anyone raising their hands. I don't think I can see people raising their hands or Oh, you got off mute, Sandy, so at least. Yeah, and no, I just unmuted. Uh, no, I, I agree. In fact, um, um, Whip and I agree that I think this will, like like you mentioned, I think this is still something you just want to put together um, in, in the beginning. So uh, this will be an important uh, thing to look into because um, th th there's many different facets here. Uh, like obviously, uh, like you mentioned, like who's really going to be putting together the standards? Like, and, and like we all know, like if there are 20 standards and there are 100 standards, that doesn't mean there's a standard. So I think that's an important point that's gonna come down to like when we're defining these CB stand, CBDC standards and especially like all the interoperability point of views, uh, how those things gonna go and then uh, which bodies like was it gonna be BIS or, or, or it could be IM, uh, you know, IMF or who could be coming up with those kind of standards. And uh, will they be accepted by other uh, parties day? Yeah, I mean, the BIS is already doing some experiments. In fact, they had an announcement, I think yesterday, mm -hmm. Project uh, Dunbar. Um, before that, they had the MCBDC. And before that, they had the Nexus project. Mm -hmm. um, Nexus was supposed to be based on existing fast payment systems, MCD. BDC is building bridges and uh, Project Dunbar presumably demonstrates the disappearance of uh, correspondent banks. And of course, all of these are for, uh, for cross-border payments and remittances. So, well, see, actually, that, if I may interrupt for a second, I think that's something I find interesting when a lot of people talk about disappearance of the correspondent banks. Um, and, and in some instances that makes sense that, okay, well, that's going to bring in, uh, you know, like speed and expediency, but, uh, does it also bring in more market risk? Does that also bring in more, uh, uh risk because now you're dealing with direct counterparties also. So, uh, no, in, it, in it's view, not direct count, counterparties. Uh, in the end, the banks in each uh, location are going to be talking to the other location without the use of correspondent banks which are uh, a tertiary layer, if you, if you may. Uh, so the tertiary layer um, is there because of the current setup of, um, of uh, exchange. But in the end, uh, you gotta have a way to discover 
a price because cost order implies FX conversion. Mm -hmm. And discover does not mean just discover, but somebody has to come and say, yes, I'm going to exchange X for Y at this rate and I will provide it. I mean, you can't just say, oh, you know, this is the rate in the market, in the FX market or whatever. They are all, totally always, always going to uh, create a spread to that that will uh, pay them for being, um, for participating. But what that spread is and how much will it be, uh, you know, today the spread is anything the market will bear. In fact, uh, we don't even know how much the spread could be because we have very little means of discovering the spot FX rate. So they'll, they'll just say, okay, if I send money, uh, dollars to India, uh, I get through uh, Western Union, I get one point, let's say 74.75. I'm just throwing out a number. Mm -hmm. But when I actually go to the spot rate, I see it is actually 76 or 77. And obviously they are taking two rupees for every uh, dollar uh, that I'm sending, and if I send thousand dollars, that is two thousand rupees. That is, you know, um, quite a bit compared to, uh, uh, you know, I don't know how much Havala guys uh, charge, but you know, this is all um, assuming that we can do these things. But again, financial sanctions. How can you implement financial sanctions? because financial sanctions have uh, turned out to be an important component of, uh, of the, you know, going to war without going to war. Um, and uh, there's always leakage. Um, so there are certain choices you can do. The prominence of the wallets is what is going to uh, control all of this. And uh, are there privacy implications? Today, people do not hesitate to, uh, to uh, out, you know, basically not be private with the social media and everything else. But whenever they say government, uh, people's hackles are raised. But really speaking, you're in great danger today um, from people like Facebook and Google. In fact, I'm sure that uh, when I created this in Google Docs or Google Slides or whatever, it's it's all there. I mean, you know, there. Take especially if I use Chrome. In spite of the fact that I'm uh, preventing them from harvesting, I mean, at least I'm setting certain things that increases my privacy, but it doesn't mean that they're not looking at some of these things. At least in the aggregate. Um, so government use use DuckDuckGo. <laughs> what, what is that? I think use DuckDuckGo. I can yeah. just making a comment on the uh, on the Chrome thing. Yeah. Yes. Um, so if you wanted to imp uh, impose financial sanctions using CBDC wallets, how are you going to do it? You have to do it at the edge. Somehow uh, send a message to the wallets saying that you cannot transfer. But then how do you do it when, if the wallet remains uh, offline, if offline capabilities are per permitted? Um, so integration with the capital markets uh, happens because we are gonna have some form of omnibus wallets in custody, uh, which we talked about last time with the bond e-value platform where the payment is happening uh, um, off chain. But even if you want to integrate it closely with the chain, then you may ha have to have third parties. And of course, self-custody wallets, we don't even know how that those would participate in the capital markets. Um, you know, For example, I want to buy bonds. How, I, how am I going to get uh, uh, my money, my payment done? Um, yeah, so hard as... as of course, was a uh, maven on tracking as uh, 
sent out a uh, email, uh, a chat message talking about how pervasive tracking is. Um, so open CBDC, uh, I wanna talk about open CBDC. Uh, so open CBDC architecture, uh, which is yet another, you know, we could spend the whole day, whole uh, call on the initial part of this, but I'm just going fast over this stuff because uh, I think it's important is that these are technical. Um, um, so there's somebody, yeah. Uh, so it is a UTXO based, uh, UHS uh, abstraction that is underlies both of them, both of the architecture architectures proposed. Some people have made uh, much of the fact that one or the other, uh, the second one especially is not a blockchain, uh, but they forget to uh, think about what exactly that means because uh, if you can somehow secure transactions in blocks by cryptographic uh, linkage, however you do it, which is the way it is being done anyway in both of them. Uh, one of them has, uh, uh, so um, let's go down the list of the common stuff, which is a geo-distributed data center, data center they say, because they are only on AWS. And I'm actually proposing a multi-cloud solution to them. Uh, the other one, and we get get to that in a second. Um, open source CBDC first to be open sourced and is written in C++, which is a familiar language to me. And I have already downloaded and forked the uh, Open CBDC DX. That's what it's called because it's transaction based. And uh, they also have uh, some deployment and uh, production controls, uh, production objectives here, which is a RTO or the RPO. The RTO is, uh, these are familiar constructs for recovery. Uh, one is recovery time, which means the system will not be down for more than X seconds. And the recovery point, which is you, here it says recovery point of zero, which means that no transactions will be lost when the system goes down. Uh, normally when you have a backup, you know, obviously when the start of the backup happens, that's the RPO, meaning recovery point, not objective, but recovery point. So unless you have multiple, you know, huge numbers of backups. So this system, which replicates um, transactions similar to a blockchain, uh, will have a RPO of zero. That is their objective anyway. So there's two uh, architectures. One is the atomizer and one is a two-phase commit. Uh, uh, and in the atomizer architecture, um, you can see that everything goes. So you have the user wallets at the outer edge, then you have the sentinels, uh, which actually do see all the details of the transaction. And the transaction is then uh, sharded and uh, private, uh, you know, privacy uh, procedure is done in three. So sentinels do see everything, but they do not keep any of that state. Uh, but if they wanted to, they could, but you know, this is part of the uh, design and it gets transformed into the UHS, the UTXO gets transformed into the UHS. And then uh, they have the atomizer, which is the blockchain based, um, sorry, um, uh, chat. Uh, um, the atomizer is doing a um, 
uh, uh, let me put it this way, a, a global ordering. And the watchtower itself is only a um, way for the wallets to get notified. Number six, it's a, it's a pull type situation. That, mean, that means wallets ask the watch, watchtower have the, trans, has the transaction gone through and the watchtower responds in seven. So it's not, a, it's not an event uh, transmission type uh, uh, architecture. It is more of a pull. And the archiver, of course, uh, goes into um, archiving the, some of the transactions. Um, anyway, I'm not going to go into the details, but note the difference in the second, in the next uh, uh, two-phase commit architecture. It's a relative ordering. It doesn't mean that one transaction um, can override another transaction because these are uh, separated. And the maximum, I, I didn't mention the maximum throughput demonstrated is 270K in the other architecture. And this is 1.7 million transactions. And geo replicated la latency is less than one second. Uh, and in the other one, it's two seconds. But anyway, these are all monster rates, because even if you look at uh, the payment uh, systems in the whole United States, at least it's only about 100K transactions per second. And if you have 170, you've more than achieved the goal, but you know they are worried about uh, scaling, uh, worried about uh, you know the future. The two things that you see here are, one is here, this is a horizontal scaling, which means that you add more uh, resources, the system scales. In this case, they claim that the system seems to scale uh, almost infinitely, which is probably not the case, but they are, they are saying, that that's what's happening, but in the other other case, because there is a uh, there is a bottleneck, it needs uh, some form of vertical scaling. So the difference between vertical and horizontal scaling is vertical scaling. You increase, you fatten a single uh, system, uh, you know, by adding more cores, more more disk, more uh, uh, computing power, and so on. But in a horizontal scaling, you basically take off the shelf software, I mean, uh, off the shelf hardware, and then you start uh, making the system scale that way, which is of course meant to be the better way of scaling things. So uh, in this two-phase commit architecture, horizontal scaling is possible. So that's another good point about this. And uh, some people have said, oh, this is not a blockchain because it's sharding. But as you know, Ethereum is uh, going for sharding and proof of stake. So, you know, when you make uh, these kind of binary uh, decisions in your head, you have to think about what exactly does that mean? You, you know, we are not marketing folks. We don't have to talk about this in a very general sense. Anyway, so as you can see there, you know, the atomizer has disappeared and the shards are now horizontally scaled, but there is a uh, transaction coordinator, but it's not just one transaction coordinator, it's transaction coordinators and it's replicated. And the same Sentinel exists. And then of course, you know that uh, the uh, archiver and the watchtower have disappeared. Uh, because there seem to be some, in nine, there seem to be some kind of a event uh, uh, push to the use of wallets. Anyway, now we come to the end of the, that particular topic, open CBDC. This is the response to the Fed uh, led by Sandy. So I want you know him to say what, if, if he wants to talk about this, that would be great. But 
I have my own uh, sort of uh, views on the matter, but I've tried to lay it out here in a very succinct slide, but with links. Yeah, uh, uh, Wipin, thank you. Uh, actually, I was just trying to put together, like if, uh, I don't know if you had a chance to look, um, I've put together like a high level timeline on the uh, yes. CBDP yes. wiki page. Mm -hmm. And uh, and and again, first of all, my apologies, uh, you know, this, of course, we started this thing almost a month or so ago. There hasn't really been a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, obvious over the surface movement. Um, I've been actually, like reading up on this, uh, like some of the points, I haven't been able to compile them together yet. But what I'm thinking is, according to the uh, the timeline I've put together, which is of course the proposed timeline, I'm hoping that, uh, like, I don't know if you can actually bring that up. Yes, I can, uh, on, just a second. On the, on the wiki page. Um, let me stop uh, sharing for a moment. Yeah, no, no uh, uh, And then I can bring up the other share. Mm -hmm. Um, let me see here. This is always a, okay, maybe I could have done it. Uh, um, now that thing has disappeared completely. So response to the Fed. I, yeah, I, can, I, I, I actually, I think I got this right here. I can share this if you want. Yes, please. Uh, okay, let me just do this really quick. Okay, right here. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Okay, uh, there hasn't really been, I mean, um, there hasn't really been like a lot of work here yet, but I just put this timeline here. So uh, everybody can just take a look at this. And I'm thinking we can finalize the list of questions uh, that we want to respond to. So uh, as we know, there are 22 questions in all, and uh, we haven't really put in these separate wiki pages for each one of them yet, but uh, we can take a look, look at those 22 questions and then see whoever wants to respond in which one. Anybody can pick anything they like to and uh, uh, compile their notes. And but if you just look at the timeline here, I'm thinking we should try to complete the research on the selected questions by 15th. Then we can have uh, some back and forth here, like draft and compile this together here and have the peer review completed by end of April and, and basically finalize the research paper by the 6th and submit it by the 13th. Now, obviously, like you've said, uh, Robin, obviously if people are free to uh, publish their own responses. This is purely just that if you want to have a combined uh, uh, brainstorming session on, on the response. And, uh, but because we have to submit responses, um, I think one question at a time, so it doesn't need to be a one single compiled paper, but I think it might be helpful to have a one single compiled, either like a Google Doc, something. So when we are reviewing it together, uh, it might actually uh, make it easier to review the whole thing together. All right, and then I actually just added a couple of links down here yesterday. I yeah, I, I actually I, caught, caught it in the in my. Uh, yeah, yeah, slide. actually, I saw that. Thank you very much. And and again, I mean, obviously, this is just a starting point. But again, uh, like for example, in the Stello paper here, uh, especially there, uh, the the policy guide paper here, they do talk about like if you have to use uh, Stellar as the blockchain. Of course, that's their viewpoint. Obviously, being that this more of their marketing thing too. So, but it does contain a bunch of important things in the ASD. Uh, like if I just bring this up here, uh, like if we had to use Stellar, what are the pros and cons of uh, using, like they, they just go down in here. And let me just see if I can bring this down here. Um, sorry. It's still loading. All right, like right here. So they, they do talk about the comparison of centralized and closed and open decentralized systems and various degrees of decentralization and whether or not it makes sense to use a blockchain or, or, or use a quasi blockchain. So just, just as a reference point here, uh, obviously this is Stellar's uh, uh, 
you know, uh, thing here. And in fact, I was looking at the, the PPS that you were talking about, uh, obviously, which comes from Project Hamilton, like Stellar is talking about five to 10. Uh, obviously, if you have to use open CDBC, uh, uh, CBDC, that's just like obviously way larger than that. Uh, even if you don't really go with their 1.7 million, but even if it's in a few hundred thousand, that's still much, much higher than this. So. Yeah, but uh, the point to be noted is uh, they still have a lot of important uh, important uh, parts to solve. Uh, they are uh, less than a toy at this point, you know. Uh, and uh, of course, you can demonstrate huge throughput when you're like when you're not not actually uh, dealing with a lot of things. Um, they focus on privacy because uh, the guys in uh, Project Hamilton are Bitcoiners, uh, and uh, you know, especially uh, James Lovejoy is a Bitcoin core developer. So, what I'm saying is, if you if you get a bunch of guys who are Bitcoiners to de uh, to develop this, you will get a system that looks very much like Bitcoin. Uh, you know. If you get a bunch of guys who are from Stellar, they, you get a system that looks very much like Stellar uh, or at least uh, similar. So this is the kind of openness that is lacking there. I mean, it, it's almost like, okay, you choose these guys, you're gonna get this. So uh, of course, it's very difficult to do a collaborative or a team-based approach but the only thing we can do is to nudge that solution that they have proposed towards something that is practicable, right? I mean, you can't just say, oh, I can't see anything, uh, but uh, uh, everything is on the wallet side and they don't even have a wallet. I mean, not a, not a good wallet. Everything is uh, done using a uh, command line interface. But as you know, going from a command line interface into to a, to a really secure wallet is a tough job. Um, well, actually talking about the wallets, I think another important thing that comes up is that if there was supposed to be wallet like, uh, you know, like take the example of this consensus thing uh, with Infura, uh, you know, the MetaMask wallets, for example, then that brings an important question that if those wallets are going in through some central APIs, like, you know, like inferior APIs, which can then be controlled by the government, then you have a much, much higher degree of, uh, of government control and, uh, and, and where, you know, they can, or, or somebody can basically turn off the wallets as, as you know, like whoever has the, the command over there. So those things will obviously come in. Of course, I, I definitely submit to the point you make that, a lot of people are completely open on Facebook and the other channels, but they, they you know, kind of quiver when it talks, uh, when it comes to the government oversight, so the government uh, 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 basically looking into any data. So, so there has to be some sort of a balance over there. But uh, but I think like even the wallets, like you know, in terms of the, the self-custody wallets, so they like, like exactly how that's gonna happen, there's, there's a lot of open questions over there. Um, I think some of the open questions come in when people talk about, uh, and this is some, this this is obviously one of the 22 questions also out there. That uh, how open uh, I don't have the questions in front of me right now, but basically, uh, like, could it be treated completely like cash in the sense that, like, how much of openness and how much of uh, uh, control the government could really have on the on the the flow? So, for example, if some vendors are using cash, they don't want to you know, divulge exactly how much cash they're dealing with. Will the CBDC usage actually force them to, uh, you know, just like they use cards today, will, will that force them to basically uh, get on the tracker? Well, there are two important differences, right? Cash already is supposed to have some uh, regulations around it, like cross-border 10,000 more, you're mm -hmm. supposed to declare it. And, uh, uh, you know, most of the time the cash is used to evade taxes or something like that, uh, but also for uh, doing other things like which are not uh, not permitted. 
So it is mostly to evade all that stuff. Another thing about cash, which nobody uh, brings up, but I did, I did uh, write about it earlier, which is uh, the physical, actual weight of cash. Like um, $1 million you can carry in a briefcase, okay? But $1 trillion, you need, uh, you need trucks, uh, maybe even 10 or 20 trucks. I had actually calculated the weight of a $100 bill. You know, the, that's the largest bill you can get. And how do you, uh, uh, how do you then, but if it's a digital wallet, $1 trillion can be held in an edge wallet with no problem. You know, it's not like uh, uh, carrying, you know, 100 trucks filled with cash uh, for $1 trillion. It's going to be just a mobile phone or some hardware wallet uh, that has the access to that. I mean, obviously, the uh, cash itself is probably somewhere else, but it's a number. It's not anything else. Um, so these considerations of physicality uh, become very uh, interesting because once you let go of that, that physicality, that means people can transact and evade uh, controls uh, if it's true privacy, right? You cannot cannot stop people from uh, uh, from taking one trillion dollars from one place to another if you do not have some kind of a surveillance or anything. I mean, not just one trillion, you know, any amount for that matter. But <laughs> uh, wallets, uh, which which the Chinese are building, for example, have tiers. Um, Less than one thousand uh, dollars is uh, considered, you know, without identification. Um, more than one thousand dollars, one thousand to two, you know, three thousand is one tier, so you have to go through KYC. Uh, anyway, so wallet design is a very important uh, aspect of things. Um, so. Uh, no, no, no. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I was just trying to bring us to the list of questions, but but I think yeah, I think yeah, that's yeah. it from my side. Uh, open today. Uh, so so I think in a nutshell, what I'm really thinking of doing is, uh, um, this is a timeline that I proposed here, and I'm gonna start picking up some of the questions here, and and just start putting some uh, answers. Uh, so, well, some answers and some some thoughts, like you know, and of course, uh, like like obviously uh, substantiate with uh, uh, some corresponding industry articles or some other things. One thing I found here, uh, as I was reading through the Stellar paper, they've been actually working with a bunch of BIS folks, including I think Danielle Aiden. I think you've been also in touch with them. Uh, so I was thinking it might actually make sense to uh, uh, even have some of these folks come and speak on our forum, if we can get them to, uh, to go over some specific questions. Yeah, I mean, uh, Daniel is one person. Uh, he's mostly involved in the um, cross-border mm -hmm. stuff in the labs. I don't know whether he, he's working on anything else, uh, but there's also a European lab. He's on the Hong Kong lab. Um, yeah. Well, interestingly, even this one, yeah, no, I remember that one. Even this one here, uh, like if you just look at the names here, uh, so they've been working with the uh, the SDF uh, CBDC working group. Uh, I don't know exactly who's a part of that, but then they do mention a bunch of other names here uh, from World Bank, from IMF, and from BIS. Yeah, in fact, Money, uh, who is on the call, and myself, we presented to uh, all of these uh, big mm -hmm. organizations, World Bank, IMF, uh, maybe not to BIS, but uh, to Bank of England, the ethaler solution, right? Which uh, we mm -hmm. um, we had created, and uh, it was one of the first, uh, actually, strangely enough, uh, that we did in the labs, uh, and uh, 
you know, we, we had certain characteristics. It was more of a wholesale CBDC based on ERC 1155, strangely enough, which is an NFT standard, but uh, we repurposed it uh, to do this. Uh, but so, yeah, uh, Daniel is definitely a known quantity to me. Uh, I don't know about these other guys. I don't think I know anybody there. I'm just reading through. Well, Harish Natarajan, we presented to actually from the World Bank. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, they are all very close to book kind of guys. But now the BIS seems to be open sourcing some stuff. And that's why I think the open CBDC project is very important. It's a first really, uh, you know, Project Hamilton is the first to open source the, uh, the code itself. I'm not talking about white papers and stuff like that. The code. Um, so I, I'll have to ask Daniel whether the code behind the MCBDC and everything else is actually open source, right? That's, that would be interesting. But going back to your thing, I think there is a bunch of names there, uh, but it's the tragedy of the commons because what happens is they all put the names, but um, nobody uh, actually comes forward and uh, contributes uh, offline. And so we have to write a couple of uh, emails that tells the people in the list to say, okay, you know what? If you want this to be uh, a real thing and your name to be associated with it, it's not enough to just put your name in a list. What are you actually bringing to the table? I I'm sorry to <laughs> act like this, but this is uh, uh, what I found that people uh, do not uh, contribute. Maybe there's something we are missing. I don't know. Uh, but I think this is a feature of, feature slash bug of all open source. Uh, I agree. 80 to 90% of the work is done by uh, like 5% or, or less of people. But uh, when it comes to putting the name on the paper, yes, everybody wants the name there. Um, yeah. This is, uh, you know, even in this group, it's the same thing. It takes a lot of effort to get people to make a presentation or, a, so I don't know how we're gonna get this task force uh, started uh, with, with respect to that aspect, uh, we have to do something about it. I uh, um, let me let me catch you offline on that. Uh, Wipin. I I'm in touch with uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh. He's from IMF, and uh, but because internally they have to kind of go through protocols to have any speaking session, uh, so I might need your help to get him to uh, come to the table for that. Um, so he seemed to be willing, but uh, like you said, I mean, it's always the, the you know, the uh, bureaucratic part of things, which kind of weigh them down too. Yes, of course. Um, so this is uh, obviously not the Manmohan Singh, but the guy who's, uh, is, is he IMF or is he a BIS? No, IMF. And oh, I think okay. he's yeah, yeah. And I think he's based in uh, either Toronto or something. I, I'll check, I'll, I'll share the details with you. Yeah, yeah, he has written some interesting papers that I've read. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, I was confused. Oh, my mom and Singh. Uh, no, he's not also, economy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's also an economist, but. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's that's not, what I initially thought, yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's a different Manmohan Singh. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's, that's great. So let us actually put some uh, words to paper. And about the last uh, bit that you mentioned, which is the um, House of Lords, mm -hmm. a CBDC, a solution looking for a problem, right? Mm -hmm. Even that heading is plagiarized 
from Governor Waller, who did the uh, who did a similar talk back in, in July, uh, July or something. Yeah, August. July, August. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I wrote a response to that, very detailed. Very, I remember that. Very detailed response yeah. uh, about financial inclusion. About you know, these are all uh, political uh, sort of things that happen because they always want to trumpet financial inclusion. Financial inclusion measurement is a tough thing, right? The FDIC comes up with the financial inclusion. Uh, so uh, it's, if you go to, uh, if you search for Waller, you'll see the response. Yeah, yeah, no, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. Unfortunately, I, ha I do have a hot stop at 10 today. So, but I, I, I've read that paper, uh, Whip, and I know. I know what you're talking about, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. so just because the House of Lords published it uh, yeah. doesn't give it, uh, you know, in my mind anyway, any validity except for the fact that it's a political uh, stance, the same as uh, Wallace stance. Um, um, you know, it's it's all about private money. Basically, uh, they keep uh, bringing the point back that private money is the solution. But they don't realize that current uh, money in the US anyway, is generated in a decentralized way, which means that every bank ha which has the capability is actually issuing, uh, issuing dollars because once, you make a, once they make a loan, which is nothing but an entry in a ledger, they can create money. Nobody, you know, everybody talks about the Fed printing money, but it is not the Fed. Most of the money is printed by commercial banks, at least before the pandemic. Um, anyway, so this is, uh, you know, people are leave, have already left. Uh, most of the people, participants have left, except for Suma. Suma, you want to say anything about all this uh, stuff? Or are you not wanting to talk? We have two minutes left before the, before the um, call is over. I think we can safely say that we have covered a lot of ground that thing, that presentation I knocked together, uh, but it's, you know, talks about the executive order, the uh, geopolitical Im implications, open CBDC project, and then our own response to the Fed. So with that, I think uh, we stop here. Uh, thanks for showing up, Sandy. Of you welcome, yeah. Ruben. Thank you. Yeah. I think you've yeah. been. Uh, I agree. I think uh, we, we need to divvy up work so we can get some real uh, meeting there. I totally agree. Yeah, maybe the thing is to start start it off so that mm -hmm. may, maybe in a, even in a provocative way so that people respond. Yeah. <laughs> Instead of, yeah. Uh, you know. Yeah. All right. Yeah, and no, I'll I'll start putting some uh, some of these answers together. Uh, to some of these questions, and then we can keep chiming in, and uh, let's let's take it from there. So yeah, hopefully we'll stick to this timeline that we have here, and uh, get this going. Yes, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thanks everybody. Uh, well, the only other person here is Suma. Uh, so thank you, and we'll uh, speak uh, later. Yep. Thank you, Weapon. Thanks for spearheading spearheading this. All right.